Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to Movie House Concessions here on the MHM Podcast Network. Each episode, we pull a random film from the display case to see if it is as fresh as the day it was released. I'm Chad. I'm Chris. And I'm Patrick. And for today's episode, we are reviewing 1998's Wild Things, directed by John McNaughton, written by Stephen Peters, and starring Matt Dillon, Nev Campbell, Denise Richards, and Kevin Bacon. But before we begin, let me provide a family-friendly summary of this 20th century neo-noir. Well, I have a question. Does Gazetta only appear when there's nudity in a film? Because that, that that seems to be a consistent pattern here. <laughs> that is in this contract. Yes, it is. <laughs> Sam Lombardo is a well-respected guidance counselor at Blue Bay High School, located in a richy rich Miami, Florida suburb. Lombardo is very popular with the student body and teaches a sailing class as an extracurricular activity. The ultra-wealthy Kelly Van Ryan, a senior at Blue Bay, accuses Sam of raping her in his apartment after she and a friend washes his Jeep during a charity fundraiser. Kelly's mother and Blue Bay socialite, Sandra Van Ryan, vows to bring Sam Lombardo to justice for sexually assaulting her daughter. A few days later, Kelly's fellow Blue Bay student, Susie Toller, who lives in a rundown trailer near the Everglades, comes out and accuses Lombardo of raping her also. These criminal accusations lead Sam to engage an eccentric strip mall attorney, Kenneth Bowden, to defend him at his high school, excuse me, to defend him at his high-profile trial. During Sam's rape trial, Bowden is able to get Susie to confess that Kelly coerced Susie into staging a revenge scheme against Lombardo. Kelly, who had feelings for her guidance counselor, learned Sam was having an affair with her mother, Sandra, and became ultra-bitter. Susie also wanted revenge on Sam, her mentor, for not bailing her out of jail when she was arrested on a minor drug possession charge. The girls have a violent altercation in the full courtroom, further confirming their scheme. Ultimately, Sam was exonerated, and it was decided Kelly had perjured herself while she was testifying about the rape. To protect Kelly from being charged with perjury, amongst other numerous crimes, Sandra's attorneys negotiated a $8.5 million settlement with Ken Bowden on Sam's behalf. Sandra siphoned the money from Kelly's trust fund, further angering the young vixen and making Sam Lombardo a multimillionaire. Shortly after receiving his money, Sam returns to his apartment to find Kelly Van Ryan waiting for him. The two begin to passionately celebrate their successful scheme against Kelly's mother, Sandra, and we learn the duo has had been planning the fake rape scenario so they could get the money out of Kelly's trust fund and run off together. During the celebration, Susie, their willing accomplice, arrives at the apartment, and the three begin to have the most passionate menage a trois in South Florida history. The trio want to have one night of ecstasy together, before they begin phase two of their plan and disappear. Police detectives Ray Duquette and Gloria Perez begin to suspect the trio has scammed everyone from the beginning and start to put pressure on the girls, sensing Lombardo is the ringleader of this whole scheme. Duquette tries to convince Susie that Sam is hiding money in an offshore bank account, cutting her out of the plan and running off with Kelly. A shaken Susie and Kelly question Sam on the phone just before they have a dynasty-level catfight into Kelly's swimming pool, 
then begin to kiss and disrobe each other and have the most passionate menage a dos in South Florida history. While all of this is happening, a very perverted detective, Duquette, is capturing it all on video, just like Chris G. would. Sam meets up with Kelly and Susie nights later for another celebration, but it was all a setup between Sam and Kelly to kill off Susie. While Kelly gets a blanket from her vehicle, Sam appears to have bludgeoned Susie to death, wrapped her up in plastic, and got her ready to be dumped in the swamp. Sam and Kelly do get to the swamp and dispose of Kelly's or Susie's body, excuse me, making it look like or phase two of their plan has been taken care of. Against the wishes of the Blue Bay District Attorney and their superiors, Detectives Duquette and Perez continue to closely investigate Sam and search for a now missing Susie. Thanks to one of Lombardo's trusted students, Ray is led to the general area of where Susie's was killed. Duquette finds blood trails and Kelly's tooth. Later that evening, while surveying Sam's apartment, Perez is visited by Lombardo, who provides her with evidence that may incriminate Kelly in Susie's death. Ray subsequently enters the Van Ryan compound without a warrant and confronts Kelly in the guest house. From an exterior point of view, the audience sees gunshots being fired inside the guest house. Ray receives a shoulder wound during his altercation, and Kelly is killed with two shots to her bosom. Days later, Blue Bay's internal investigation determines Kelly's death was, justifi- was a justified shooting. But Ray is terminated because he intentionally disobeyed direct orders from his superiors and illegally entered the Van Ryan house. At the same meeting, the district attorney announces they have sufficient evidence to prove Kelly killed Susie, despite the fact that Susie's body was never found. These cases are officially closed, and Sam Lombardo has left town to begin his new life. Soon after, Sam is seen in, on a tropical island, living the good life. When he returns to his beachside cabana, Sam is surprised to find his partner in crime, Detective Ray Duquette, taking a hot shower. The duo begin to argue that Kelly was not supposed to be killed, just framed for Susie's death. Also, Ray is not happy that he has not yet received his share of the money. They agree to bury their grievances for the time being, share some beers, and enjoy their new lives. While out on a large sailboat, Sam cons Ray into dealing with a loose rigging, then rocks the boat so Duquette is tossed overboard. Ray climbs back aboard the boat and confronts Sam. However, a much alive Susie Toller shoots Duquette with a spear gun twice, then tosses the former detective into the ocean to sleep with the fishes. We learn Susie wanted Duquette dead because Ray had killed her friend Davy while Davy was defending a local swamp girl from a vicious Ray Duquette beatdown. While Sam and Susie celebrate their master plan, Sam starts to feel ill, and Susie confesses to poisoning Sam's drink. Susie, who has a skilled sailor, uses a beam to send the former guidance counselor to his death. A victorious Susie sails off to live her life in the sun with all of Sam's money. The end. But that's not all. That's not all. The viewing audience is gifted with mid credit scenes that fill in all of the movie storyline gaps. How did Sam and Kelly meet? How did Susie fake her death? Was Kelly's death justified? What caused Susie to use Sam, Kelly, and Ray as her pawns? To find the answers of these questions and many, many more, you'll have to listen to the entire entire podcast and watch today's featured film, Wild Things. So, Patrick, did you get wild with the statistical analysis on this film? Uh, well, real quickly, that must be the most PG explanation of this movie ever. <laughs> well, yeah, that and the fact polite. that we've turned uh, Chris into a pervert the entire time, the videotaping. <laughs> I, I didn't have a response. <laughs> I'm, I'm very disappointed in myself. 
All right. Wild Things was released on March 20th, 1998, the same day as Mr. Nice Guy with Jackie Chan and Primary Colors with John Travolta, the same month as U.S. Marshals, Twilight, and that would be the Paul Newman version of Twilight with a nude scene by Reese Witherspoon. I'm sure uh, Chris already knew that. Uh, The Big Lebowski, The Man in the Iron Mask, The Newton Boys, and Chris's all-time favorite film, Chairman of the Board with Carrot Top. There you go. Carrot Top. Made on a budget of $20 million, the film grossed just over $30 million in the North American bo- uh, box office. It was the 64th highest grossing film of 1998, behind such classics as Mercury Rising, Bridge, or Bridge, Bride of Chucky, and A Night at the Roxbury, and right in front of such films as Elizabeth, Madeline, and Spice World. Uh, ultimately, it made $67.2 million worldwide. was followed by three direct to DVD sequels, Wild Things 2 in 2004, Wild Things Diamonds in the Rough in 2005, and Wild Things Foursome, because you always have to increase the number of people involved in 2010, and Rotten Tomatoes has it at 63% critics and 53% audience, and that is the numbers on Wild Things. And yes, Chris, I do own all three of the sequels, so you're not the only one. (laughs) Surprisingly, I've never seen any of them other than the first one. (laughs) The second one, not so good. Third one, pretty decent. The fourth one, it's okay. Define pretty decent. (laughs) Pretty decent. There's a good amount of uh, exposure in that movie. Okay. So let's see. Unlike our friend Chris Haley, who is the mayor of Noirsville, I wasn't able to watch this neo-noir in theaters on opening night. Instead, I had to wait a week, then slink my way into a sparsely populated matinee and was very much stimulated by this softcore Lifetime movie. Wild Things was wild and crazy and a lot of fun to watch back then. I was shocked to learn Wild Things wasn't a bigger deal while in theaters, but everyone I knew grabbed a copy as soon as it hit the shelves at our local Blockbuster. So I have to ask you, Patrick, what is your history with Wild Things? I'm sure you were there on opening night as well. I was not. I did not see this in the theater. I saw Primary Colors on opening day because I had read that book recently before that film came out. Uh, But Wild Things, uh, I at that particular moment in time, I was uh, working and going back to school trying to get my degree. And so I had little (laughs) playtime to go and see movies. And uh, this is one that just slid by me. Now, when it came out on video, I saw it right away. So about six months later, I saw it. Uh, but by then, the word of mouth on the film had gotten legendary. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. How about you, Chris? I have a kind of unique experience with Wild Things. Back around the time this hit the theaters, we were trying to produce a movie, a low-budget movie, which kind of centered around people in their, their college ages. And we were interviewing a whole bunch of people that today are actually big stars. But at the time, they were just – they weren't really big names. And it started in 1997 when this process started for us. And we had a lot of people coming through. And um, it, long story short, it kind of got shelved. That project got shelved while I went and did a Disney movie. And then after the Disney movie, we were coming back to do this, uh, our movie, and just happened to pick up a copy of this movie. Did not really know a whole lot about it. And I just remembered after watching it. I called uh, Greg, who was the guy who was producing the movie for me, and said, who the hell is Denise Richards, and why have we not interviewed her? And that was pretty much all I needed to know about Wild Things, and that was my introduction. <laughs> yeah, you you, you, and about everybody else wanted to know who she was if you didn't know her already. I did not. I yeah. had not seen Power Rangers, and Power Rangers. the one episode of Seinfeld she was on must have slipped by. Starship Troopers? Starship or Troopers. Starship Troopers, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Power Rangers would be pretty tame compared to what yeah. Starship Troopers was. <laughs> but. Yeah. Well, um, I must admit, everyone I know who uh, watched this flick watched it specifically to see Denise Richards get naked. I will say that, period, end of story. And if uh, folks out there were uh, Party of Fivers or Scream Queen fans, they may have wanted to watch this thing to see Nev Campbell in a new vehicle. Either way, Christmas came more than once a year when they had the pleasure of watching Wild Things. So I'll ask uh, you first, Chris. What did you think of these two vixens in this film? 
I thought they were great. And I don't mean just because of Denise Richards' lovely breasts, which look great in champagne. I thought they had I thought they were they both played their parts to a T. It was a perfect role for Denise Richards, who doesn't, you know, arguably doesn't have much range um, and doesn't need it. This is a perfect role for her. And Nev Campbell is kind of the goth, you know, version of Sydney and Scream uh, worked out perfectly. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I thought Denise was perfect for this casting wise. I mean, rich bitch, beautiful, hot body. What more could you ask for? And Not then, a lot. Yeah. And, and Nev, I think she fits the, the T in almost every role she's in. And uh, this, like you said, a goth, cute chick who is a scary genius. It wouldn't have shocked me at the least. So I'll ask you, Patrick, what did you think of these ladies? Well, I, I was familiar with Denise Richards before seeing this film because I had seen Starship Troopers and she made an impression on me on that. I did not recall her from Seinfeld, but I now I've seen that episode. And the reason you probably don't remember it is she's supposed to be playing a young high school girl. <laughs> so <laughs> that George leers at her breast for and gets in trouble with her father. But uh, this, it's a very blink and you miss it type of role. But I, you know, I, as much as I knew who she was, I hated her in Starship Troopers. I'll still, to this day, criticize that film of, hey, the loyal girl who sticks by you and shows her true love. Oh, she's got to fucking die. But the bitch who dumps you, <laughs> that's the girl you're going to end up at the end of the film that you're going to risk your life to save. You know, like, God, ah, that just never made any sense to me. But no, I, I distinctly remember her. I agree with you. Denise Richards was perfectly cast for this role. Uh, one of the few roles that she her limited range does accommodate. I am not a huge Nev Campbell fan. I, I thought she was fine in Scream. I thought uh, she was a little bit miscast in this up until the twist, and then I, fi- you know, then I find her a little bit believable. But I, I don't believe that she plays swamp trash that well. Um, I mean, she she seems too intelligent to be that character, uh, and that's why it always it always seemed like there was something missing about it, and that's why the twist at the end doesn't really surprise me. Um, but I I'm not a huge Neff Campbell fan. Other than Scream and this, I'd be hard pressed to think of another film or the another uh, series of films that I've seen her in. Well, there is a lovely film out there called When I When Will I Be Loved, where uh, Nev likes to finally get naked and show off about everything she has and have her own little masturbation scene, if I remember right. So I want to give that to the listening audience out there. And Chris, if you haven't seen it either. I've never heard of it. Yeah. When Will I Be Loved? That's the one to look for. <laughs> well, see, I'm not a big Nev Campbell fan either, so I don't know that I would go hunting that one down. No problem. No problem. <laughs> well, I don't know of anyone who watched this flick to see drugstore cowboy Matt Dillon or Kevin Bacon's dong get footloose, uh, but they were the most notable names and accomplished actors in this film uh, in a leading role, I'll put it that way. Okay. So <laughs> what were your thoughts, Patrick, of Dillon, Sam Lombardo, and Bacon's detective Ray Duquette? You know, uh, I've never been a huge fan of Matt Dillon, although I think he had a renaissance around this time between this and um, there's something about Mary that he came in to kind of his own again. Kevin Bacon, I've always generally liked Kevin Bacon in films. I mean, he's just he's too much of an 80s stalwart for me that when he makes a film, it generally draws my attention just because he's in it. Uh, I, 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 I thought they both did fine. I had no problem with it. Uh, their their performances, I thought they fit the roles pretty well. Matt, Matt Dillon strikes me as sleazy, uh, <laughs> yep. Just in general, in life, <laughs> and and I think he can play that role. I mean, that's it, he's unfortunately played that in mo- most of the films I've seen him in. Um, Kevin Bacon, I you know I really did believe him as the the, the kind of the honest detective uh, at the at the beginning of the film. So that's that's where the the twist was effective for me, as I did not expect him to be part of it, and that was uh, I. Thought thought a, a, a good casting and kind of playing it playing against type yeah i i with um matt dylan yeah he was having that renaissance uh was it uh the one with nicole kidman that he was in to die uh, for. So running back to can't die, remember the name of that to one die for. for yeah that's it so yeah so that one brought him back like you said something about mary brought him back and then he was around forever after uh that so yeah, I always liked him when he was younger. I mean, he was a scuzz bucket in most of his movies. Um, he fit the perfect 
mold here is a SCUS bucket guidance counselor. I could believe it. Bacon, I know this movie essentially got made because of him since he was the executive producer and who one who basically greenlit the whole thing. Yeah, now that's, that's a powerful why, dick. <laughs> I was just gonna say why he had to go full schlong to make this movie, I have no idea, but he did. So it is what it is. I thought I'm like you, Patrick. I thought his twist was the funniest one. I just didn't see that one coming uh, when I originally watched it, but it made sense in the end. That's what uh, you had said inside. too. <laughs> <laughs> so, what about you, Chris? What did you think about these two gentlemen? I thought they were good. I agree with you both that Dylan has always been a little slimy and uh, fit the role perfect as you know the the guidance counselor that you know all this all the female students wanted to get with. And Bacon, he's always good when he plays that kind of arrogant, smarmy kind of grown up guy from animal house. And I thought he fit it perfectly. I didn't need to see, you know, little bacon along the way, but you know, aside from that, no, it was good. They, they fit their roles. Well, I thought the whole movie was really well cast. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And that's what I was going to get to next. Uh, we have a who's who of quirky characters portrayed by Teresa Russell and Robert Wagner, Jennifer Taylor, and the always great bill Murray. Uh, they rounded out the cast and I have always appreciated Murray's turn in this is a very sketchy ambulance chasing strip mall attorney like Ken Bowden. It just made sense that he would fit this role. And I love that he had the final word in this movie, so to speak. So I'll ask you first, Chris, what did you think of these little side characters? And did you think they all fit perfectly or not? Oh, God bless Bill Murray. I'm just going to say, God bless Bill Murray. You know, as soon as he comes onto the screen, the movie just really takes off he is perfect and um, as far as the other characters go i've i had always had a little thing for Teresa russell back in the early 80s i i you know she always plays that icy you know persona well you know liked her all the way up through black widow and then not so much after that robert wagner was you know perfect as as the lawyer tom baxter I thought everybody was just really well cast all the way down to I love Bill Murray's secretary, Lenore. Every time, you know, hey, Lenore, hold my calls. OK, Mr. Bowden, you know, the casting in this movie was absolutely spot on top to bottom. Yeah, I agree. I agree. What about you, Patrick? Well, I, I love Bill Murray, uh, despite him getting a lot of grief lately uh, for inappropriate behaviors on sets. Um, I think he always adds something to a film. I really like him when he's not playing the lead and he's doing something small like this. I, I, th I think that's very entertaining. Uh, this and Zombieland off the top of my head are the two that I, I think are really kind of just show Bill Murray at his best. You know, I, uh, Robert Wagner, I, I thought was a, a well cast Teresa Russell. Uh, I'm not as big a fan of her. I remember her from the eighties, but uh, she made a lot of crap <laughs> too. That I never well, watched. a lot of crap. Yeah. A lot of crap. Uh, but <laughs> I, I said, I, I like Teresa Russell, not her movies. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, but I thought for the role that she was cast for, I thought she was playing pretty, pretty well. I mean, obviously immensely attractive and, and seems to play that kind of rich bitch uh, attitude. It feels very comfortable in the role, but yeah, I mean, there was a, a ton of, Great performances by the supporting cast that I think really plays well throughout the entirety of the film and really adds some depth to it. So it doesn't have to be carried by the the technical four leads. Right, right. Well, I am a big fan of eccentric crime films, and I know Patrick and I have reviewed Basic Instinct and A History of Violence, to name a couple uh, films here recently that I would put in that category. So I'm I absolutely adore watching this one. But um, I don't know how everybody else feels. So what do you think, Chris, about these uh, ever-evolving storylines like you have in here that are very eccentric, very neo-noir, very oddball, and constantly shifting and turning to get until you get to the very end? See, I loved it because I think people who take this movie seriously like they did with Basic Instinct or movies like that are missing the point of this. This movie is almost – goofing on itself it knows what it is it's not trying to be one of those other movies and so all the you you could you could poke holes all the way through this movie but it's not that kind of movie you just go into it and again as soon as you see bill murray on the screen if you're still taking it seriously you're missing the point of the movie it's 
I love all the twists. I love the way they tie it up at the end. And again, it's almost like it's a, a spoof of itself the way they the way they do it. I you get the feeling that they know exactly what they're doing with this movie and they're just going to do it to the full. They're just going to say, fuck it. We're going to do it all the way. Right. Right. And I, I've always joked, this is like a uh, lifetime movie on steroids in a way, a soft core uh, lifetime movie on steroids. And that's what I always thought was the fun part of it is it's just sort of a, sort of a joke in a way, but it's so entertaining to watch if you see it that way, but also take it just a little bit serious and have some fun with it as a crime drama it's it's a blast. And so I'll ask you, Patrick, what did you think of the storyline in this one? I mean, it, I, I agree with what Chris just said. It's just it's it's a film that is it, it almost tongue in cheek that it knows what it is. And it's just, you know, relishing in what it is. And it, and it caught an audience, not a huge box office audience, 30 million. I was actually surprised it only made $30 million because I just remember a lot of people talking about it, but it probably made twice that on VHS and DVD when it came out in 98 into video stores. I mean, it was <clears throat> a film that everybody was talking about for a period of time and uh, obvi- and for, you know, for n- nefarious reasons because of the nudity and the threesome scene, but it, it it was just a fun, enjoyable ride. You know, the same old, you, you and I talked about Basic Instinct a couple months ago that it was fun. OK, it was it, you know, it's it has some problems, uh, it has a lot of problems, you know, <laughs> just like Basic Instinct. But it it doesn't pretend to take itself too seriously. It's like it, this is just romp. This is just fun. This is popcorn fair at its sleaziest, if you will. Uh, and 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 audiences didn't necessarily come out there, but it, it drew an audience much later. And to you could argue, uh, caused the career of Denise Richards to explode for a brief period of time after this. I mean, because this le- leads her to being a Bond girl. I mean, this is what catapults her to there. It wasn't Starship Troopers that did it, and certainly not a cameo in Seinfeld. So... I mean, it, it, it was a launching pad for a lot of people and, you know, and kind of solidified Matt Dillon as one of the, the lead actors for the, the decade of the 90s. Well, before Marvel included mid and or end credit scenes in all of their films, Wild Things uh, peppered scenes throughout their end credits to help explain plot points, tie up loose ends and definitely swerve the audience. I personally love this gimmick. Um it was so cool. It was like a cool mind fuck to say to be very, very straightforward. Um, I'll ask you first, Patrick. Did you like these scenes, or was it a needless gimmick at the time? It was a needless gimmick. I didn't like them. I mean, I I I hadn't seen this in so long. I'd forgotten that sequence of it. Unfortunately, I didn't turn it off as soon as the credits started rolling. Um, but I remember it at the time. It's like, hey, I already enjoyed the film, and you giving me these little vignettes of how the pl- how the plot all came together behind the scenes I already took the journey you know I, it, to me it just didn't really add anything to the film um i uh, other than to me it, it's just a, possibly a, a you're trying to address those people who have justification and go oh well, you'll never figure it out because there's no re- there's it doesn't make any reason for it you know the, now they're giving you the reasons for it and i i, I to me, you're never going to win over those audience members that, that d- want to see it on the film and say, oh, I, I, I should have saw it coming because it was obvious. It, it, it wasn't obvious. You know, it was it was uh, something that was it was just it, here's a twist and you're not going to predict the twist because there's no fucking way you're going to figure it out. Because <laughs> this this isn't Sixth Sense. This is Wild Things. We're here to show you breasts not to show you a twist point so that you can rewatch it a second time. You're going to rewatch it a second time, but not to watch the twist point. <laughs> what did you think of the gimmick, Chris? Well, I agree half and half with Patrick. I, it was a gimmick, but I did enjoy it. And what it, I think the reason I enjoyed it was a little different reason. Cause I agree. You didn't need to fill in the blanks with those, with those little clippets at the end. But I liked it because it made me kind of go back and appreciate how they did it while they were shooting it. They were constantly leaving out pieces where, you know, they would dip to black a lot. They they would leave holes in there deliberately that they were filling in at the end. And so I kind of liked the thought process that went through 
how they piece the movie together and leaving those holes blank to fill in at the end. So I had an, a, an appreciation for that. And, uh, and, you know, I like the fact that it gave you that one little last chance to see, you know, see everybody at the end one last time. So I, I you know, it's a gimmick. Yeah. But I kind of enjoyed it. A uh, guilty pleasure, I guess it would have been better if they'd have had one more shot of Denise Richards breast, but you know, you can't have everything. Well, let me help you out there, my friend. I, Talk uh, to me, Goose. <laughs> so I uh, watched the unrated version before this podcast. And in the unrated version of the movie, you get two extra scenes there in mid-credits. And one of them, the first one you actually see is where Sam and Kelly end up getting introduced to each other, essentially. She walks into his bar that he likes, and she is just... Uh, been mourning the death of her father and she goes to talk to him and i think she gives him some coke or he gives her coke or whatever it is is that what she gives him the dog collar uh that's that's that leads that is the weekend where Susie gets arrested if i remember right or it leads up to it so you get to see that so you get to see where those two sort of get their bond and then you get a second scene that you don't see in the theatrical release where it is after Kelly goes into Sam's apartment after she washes his Jeep and instead of just standing there staring at him, now they're for full on doggy style and you do get to see her breast one more time. I think it was her right one uh, in a little bit of action between the two of them. So that's a little bit added into it. There's also the swimming pool scene between Nev and Denise is extended out further so you do get uh kelly's uh, breasts in that scene if you watch it in the unrated version and there's another scene also at, tacked on to the unrated version where detective perez is talking to Susie's aunt and basically they lead you to believe that sandra van ryan and Susie are technically half sisters because they're uh, Sandra's father went to the Everglades and screwed around all the time and had a baby he didn't know about, which turned out to be Susie. So essentially, Susie and Kelly are having their intercourse while they're technically blood relation. Well, now that adds an interesting twist to this whole movie. That <laughs> Two things about that. If... <laughs> Where do I start? The first part you mentioned about the scene with Denise Richards and Matt Dillon in the hotel room right. probably deserves to be on the cutting room floor because that defeats the whole purpose of her saying that he raped her, right. which kind of would screw the whole, you know, the whole movie up if you could screw it up more in that regard. So that's unnecessary. I'm glad that didn't make it into the movie. And but the part about the father I had heard there were stories about was were they half sisters was Nev Campbell her aunt or whatever and but I had never really known how or why that became a a rumor or a thought process until you just explained yep. it that would make sense and that would add a hell of a good little <laughs> extra twist to the movie I think that's awesome I'm surprised that didn't uh, make it into the uh, theatrical release and as I understand, the only part of the script, the original script that they had cut out altogether was also Sam and Ray were supposed to end up being lovers. But everybody seemed to think that that was going too far. So they never even got that one uh, uh, into filming. So, yeah, well, uh, we don't need that. Yeah, you don't ne need yeah, that yeah, Nevin Denise is OK. We don't need uh, Matt and Kevin. <laughs> totally unnecessary. Could you imagine if they tried that back in 1998? I think. Uh, I don't know how that would have gone over back then. I mean, 25 to almost 25 years ago. Uh, I think if they do that, if they tried to do that today, absolutely. I think that would be almost a given that you would expect that, but I don't think 25, you know, 24 years ago, that would have, I don't think that would have flown back then. I think, yep. I, I think you probably could, they probably could have gotten away with it in this film. Really? I mean, what, I mean, yeah, you know, in this, maybe in this one, cause they've set it up so much with, you know, with the with the ladies, but yeah, I mean, it, I mean, you're at this point, 1998. You're what, 17 years after Death Trap with Superman kissing Michael Caine, so and and their gay relationship and that twist of that film. Yeah, but he was Superman. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, Ke uh, Kevin Bacon is not Superman. Certainly not. 
It definitely would have shocked everybody. It would have made that sh- shower scene seem a little bit more, um, let's see here, a uh, uh, what's the word? It would have made more sense because they were a little bit too close in that bathroom. Yep. Did anybody expect that when he goes walking in? They're like, "What?" I'm curious, what parts did you not see coming? I mean, what parts really just like, oh, wait a minute. I thought it was this. Now it's this. I mean, did the, that that part, I didn't I didn't see that one coming. I thought that Matt uh, or that Kevin Bacon was dirty the whole time. I think you get the sense of that when he runs in there and shoots Kelly, but they don't show it. They stay outside. Um, and I think that right there is the setup that you just kind of know, having seen enough movies and just knowing kind of where it's going, that he probably did exactly what he did there. But I still didn't see him and uh, Dylan being in cahoots. Yeah. All right. Well, give us your thoughts and let us know what you think about Wild Things. And I'm going to start with you, Chris. Uh was it as titillating as the day it was released, or does it leave a burnt taste in your mouth? And can you uh, give me a ranking from one to five stars, please? I think it holds up well today, just like it did back then. I don't know if I find it titillating like I did back then, because, you know, a lot older now, it just seems, well, part of it is it just seems wrong because they're playing high school girls, even though they're like 28 years old. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't quite say that, but I think it holds up well. I enjoyed it again because I just like those kinds of movies that have the plot twists and things like that, like usual suspects and movies of that nature. So I, I enjoyed it. I would give it probably about a three and a half out of five. Okay. Okay. What do you about you, Patrick? What do you think? You know, I had not seen this for an an extensively long period of time. I saw it a a few times in the late nineties once it had come out. Uh, I didn't even know there was an unrated version of it, which is kind of surprising. Usually I'm aware of those things, but I, you know, I really liked it when I saw it. Uh, it was one that I ultimately purchased on one of the first DVDs I ever purchased and watching it now, it, it, it's a little bit hammy. It's a little bit, you know, I can, I can see where there's a lot of criticism of it, but I still thought it was a good time. I, I, I thought, you know a lot there was nobody who was horribly cast in the film uh, and it was just a good interesting you know sex romp of a murder mystery i like the twist as- aspect of it uh, it was kind of a, a nice uh, neo noir uh, the film uh, that you didn't get a lot of in the late 90s and ultimately i, I would i kind of go around where chris is it's like 3 to 3 and a half stars is where i think it's at i i still enjoy it um, I didn't enjoy it as much as maybe like Basic Instinct, uh, which I think is a much there's more money into it. You can see, uh, but it doesn't have nearly as many plot holes as uh, Basic Instinct. I think that's uh, it, it, the holes it has. They don't even try to plug up uh, at all. They just gloss right over there with look at these breasts. There you go. You know? <laughs> and, that, and that solves the problem right there. Well, I'm, I'm with both of you. I still enjoy it. It's still a fun watch. I probably haven't seen it in about a decade plus, but I still got a lot of enjoyment out of watching this one again. It's still a lot of fun. I, too, love these weird neo-noir swerve movies that try to make you look one way, but you actually come at you from another. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and I'll give it about a you know three-and-a-half to four-star type uh, grade. Probably when I was younger, it would have been four to five, but you know, you've seen more movies, you've had more experiences, but it's still a lot of fun. And yes, I still think everybody's going to watch it for Denise for the most part, but it's still a fun movie from start to finish. I would recommend it to almost anybody who is an adult and enjoys these type of things. Well, that is it for our review of wild things. Please let us know what you think of the film in the comments section on our website and rate it from one to five stars. If there's a film you'd like for us to review, please send us an email to comments at moviehousememories.com and give us your name, location, and film choice. Please follow the MHM Podcast Network on YouTube, Twitter, and Stitcher to stay abreast of all the network's latest releases. Last but certainly not least, please use the Amazon link on our website, moviehousememories.com, to buy all of your wild things needs. If you would like to own wild things rated or unrated, 
uh, please pick up a copy at our online store located at moviehousememories.com. And just to remind everybody, Chris bought the last pair of white underwear that to stick into his pants that came off the East Richards. So that's completely <laughs> sold out. Can't get any more of that. You can't get those, not even on Amazon. <laughs> Well, that does it for this episode of Movie House Concessions. Until next time, I'm Chad. I'm Chris. And I'm Patrick. And this concession stand is now closed. This podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The song Rock On Brudda is brought to you by Marwan Nimra at natintine.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Movie House Concessions, the MHM Podcast Network, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted. <laughs>